Orion, hi, welcome to Talk Sex to Life. I'm so glad we are finally having this conversation. <laughs> Indeed, it's been a while that we've been trying to get this going. Yes, it, it it feels like a trekking expedition. <laughs> you know, that I've been on some trekking expedition. Something other yeah. used to uh, crop up, and finally we are having this. I thank you so much for your time. Thank you. No, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Um, so, how have you been doing? Um, considering the times, of course, we can't get away without discussing. You know, uh, the situations that we are in, um, the situation that we are in. So. and you are a partner at one of the biggest consultancy firms uh, in india of course i mean worldwide uh, what were the immediate challenges that you have faced and how did you handle this given the fact that you know we have uh, a very large uh, operations in china so we were smack dab in the middle of you know the whole uh, crisis as it was starting to emerge and as a firm you know we took a lot of proactive steps uh, which were quite foundational in nature and uh, i think so we started tracking it first sometime around the middle to end of january uh, when it was still very very contained in wuhan and uh, slowly but surely started spreading but we were literally on a week for week uh, advisory in terms of how the disease was progressing out there what was the chance that the disease would actually go out of china and you know from the time when the first few cases um popped up in europe and the us and so on and so forth so as a firm i think so we at no point in time took this lightly uh, mm -hmm. you know as a firm there were two or three things which were paramount to us right the first was you know clearly protecting you know all our employees right. and everybody in the firm so that was like numero uno priority for us i think so as much as we were taking care of our teams we were also thinking about how could we really stand by our clients uh, during this moment of crisis and uh, and independent of any kind of commercial strings you know we were saying that look if there is any time to stand by your client it is now we were getting to a situation where pretty much you know the bulk of our work was all about a protecting our teams b protecting you know our clients now as we kept getting deeper and deeper into the pandemic um, it also became quite clear that the way we were used to working and serving our clients and dealing and you know helping our teams work and deliver to our client i mean we are at the end of the day a client service firm um you know and our single largest assets are our teams i mean we had to essentially make sure that the collaboration the teams well being you know all of that was being taken care of so there were quite a few things that we were doing in terms of ensuring that there were a bunch of things that we did as a firm in terms of just helping you know our teams kind of deal with the situation i mean we do everything from work to fun parties to theme parties to fancy dresses to typically once a year we have a large outing where the entire office you know meets up and it's a it's a little bit of you know talking about how we are doing as a firm and our path moving forward but the bulk of it is about really bonding and camaraderie within the teams and uh, believe it or not we did that entire thing on a digital platform just a couple of weeks back you know if we take a little bit of a pulse in terms of how you know we are coping as a firm i think so we have coped quite well you know and uh, it is much better than what one would have envisaged at the beginning of the pandemic going forward what are the changes that you think are likely to stay in the post covid era too in the way perhaps organizations uh, consultancies are um, i mean therefore in consulting the bulk of our time is really spent in in front of the client at the client prem and you know we are rolling up our sleeves we are hitting the whiteboard we are solving complicated problems you know we are developing multiple business scenarios so it's a very high engagement business that we run and in this setup if you think about where we are today vis-a-vis -vis what we have done for the last you know so many decades i mean we've been running with virtually no face time with our client i mean barring the few exceptions here and there i mean for all practical purposes the client is in the client's home we are at our homes and our teams right. are working and i would say that we have adapted quite well the clients have adapted well we have adapted quite well and you know if we hear the narrative coming from various you know industry leaders from multiple segments you will hear a range of commentary about you know some saying that this is you know fantastic and oh by the way we don't think we're going to get more than you know 10% of our employees ever back to the office 
hmm. because this works just fine hmm. then you will have some who say that you know while we have done great in the last 6 7 months but if you really talk about productivity i think so our productivity has taken a hit hmm. so for the same amount of time that our teams are spending and when i say our i mean the clients ours right. everybody's uh, you don't get the same return on that investment of time Hmm. yeah because you know at the end of the day there is an intrinsic value in terms of looking somebody in the eye and you know looking at a whiteboard and really scribbling stuff and solving stuff today that is not happening look i think so this is going to be the new normal i believe that there are many things of how we have dealt with the crisis in the last 6 months will land up being adopted in the future hmm. but i am not so certain that this will be done to the extent at which we are doing it today right so again i mean it's going to completely vary by sector it's going to vary by the type of job um, but one thing is certain that it is going to look different you know mm-hmm. the you know um, the industries are going to be much more open to mm-hmm. alternate ways of working i think so it will in general have a positive impact in terms of you know how firms you know compete in their segments you know how firms treat their employees and their overall human capital hmm. so those are things to change how much i think so that is anybody's guess so what are the what, what are some of the key attributes you think this of a new age consultant uh, <clears throat> that you see i think so being digitally savvy and understanding how digital plays a role in improving the performance trajectory of you know companies is going to be critical I mean if I rewind the clock 5 years you know consulting was I mean if you were consulting a company in industrial goods right I mean technology was you know far and few in between mm. you know uh, whereas if you are if you are advising a company you know that runs a series of manufacturing plants today technology is you know absolutely integral to the solution portfolio because mm. you're saying that you know how can technology make you perform your you know your services your products better than what you've ever done before um the second i would also say is um, being mindful of what sustainability means you know to right. us to our clients mm-hmm. and to their clients i think so will again become very important you know for people to really do justice to helping our clients you know outperform what they have done up until now what's been a general take in terms of uh, this remote working and maybe work life balance has it been more skewed or were you able to uh, pull out some more hours uh, you know with that flexibility that's there that's been added to this entire mix as long as um, you know we are cognizant of the fact that the demands on our you know work and are managing the home uh, you know our our uh, our aspects at home you know need to be taken care of right now uh, you know as long as that appreciation is there uh, as long as the flexibility to be able to enable that is there hmm. it's a very doable thing so i definitely feel that you know there has been a lot of time that's been freed up on account of you know this fundamental need of not needing to travel uh but it is for me to determine what i do with that time you know if i freed up you know let's say five flights on an average you know let's say four hours of you know door to door time or say five hours that's 25 incremental hours a week mm. i mean you know maybe i'm giving back 10 or 15 of those hours to you know for quote and quote client service right. and i'm using the rest for you know maybe pursuing a hobby of my own you know maybe mm. doing something with my kids which i've never done before So I'm thoroughly enjoying it. I was trying to understand of course you have been an a trekker in spite of this busy schedule five flights a week you still managed to keep that passion of yours alive in terms of climbing those going to treks mountains I love. So how have you been managing to do that? When did this uh, whole love for trekking come in? I think so my first trek was uh, in 2001 if I'm not wrong. so about 20 years back and wow. um, it was a trek in the um, you know in the sawtooth mountains which is a peripheral range to the rockies mm-hmm. uh, and um, and this was a day trek um, and unlike the indian treks 
which we mm-hmm. call as a sahib style trekking where you walk and there is a bunch of people carrying your stuff in right. the us or in europe right. you pretty much carry everything yeah, everything and so this was a trek my wife and i and the composition of the trek was we had a friend from mexico we had two friends from the us and we were the two of us five of us day trek about 21 22 kilometers in one day mm-hmm. we went up to about nine and a half thousand feet or so from about six thousand mm-hmm. and uh, you know i mean it was just exhilarating uh, and that is when um, uh, I was also very clear in my mind when we used to live in the US that, you know, I would eventually come back to India. And the goal clearly was that given that we were called road warriors in the US by all our you know local colleagues out there. Uh, but the plan was to come back to India and continue being a road warrior, except that it was about now seeing more of India. And I think for so a year and a half or two after coming back to India, you know, I decided that I would do one Himalayan high elevation trek a year. And uh, I think that the first one I did was perhaps in 2006 or so. Uh, And I have for the most part stayed true to the one high elevation trek a year for the most part. But I'm uh, quite interested in knowing uh, when you picked up this whole love for uh, when you did your first trek in the US, at that point you had not been to any other treks before in India anywhere. This is just maybe your friends were into trekking and they said, why don't you just hop? along is it it was correct something of that. Uh, see i used to live in a place called boise in idaho uh okay. it was a small town with a total population of two hundred and eighty thousand people um you know there were probably 500 people who were not from boise everybody else was classical white caucasian uh <laughs> in Boise. um and if you follow the history of places like boise in idaho um you know these were all the let me not get into US politics, but you know, the mm-hmm. classical Republican type places. Mm-hmm. And uh, <clears throat> so they were quite closed door to foreigners. Mm-hmm. But Hewlett Packard was actually uh, a very large entity and an employer in Boise at that point in time. I used to work for HP in California. Mm-hmm. And then I took a, uh, took a role with HP in Boise because our imaging and printing group was headquartered in Boise. And the story goes that Dave Packard you know, used to love fly fishing. And okay. Boise is very famous for fly fishing, you know, Boise and Montana, all these places. So that's where Boise first opened up a, a memory and a chipset plant in mm-hmm. Boise back in the early 70s. Okay. And uh, so this is right in the foothills of, you know, the Rockies. And mm-hmm. it is absolutely a gorgeous place, great time. And that's when I decided that, look, I mean, the mountains are just phenomenal. It just gives mm-hmm. you you know, an excuse to, cut, you know, move away from your mundane existence, get something new in your life, give you a purpose, you know, the purpose mm-hmm. to say that. Sure. Uh, so that whole excitement, you know, it's like a three, four month long project um, mm-hmm. once a year. And all of this while, of course, leading your day job and yeah. all the other fun stuff. So uh, yeah. I think that that's where it started off. And um, um, I think that when our second one was being born six weeks before you know, he came, uh, he was born, I went for a trek. And uh, I mean, the the look on the faces of everybody in our family to say that, are you serious? You're going for a trek right now? (laughs) That just tells you about how much I care for the mountains and how much I, you know, for my treks. Any plans to become a serious mountaineer? I mean, you were saying that, uh, I mean, Venkatesh Maheshwari, you you heard the podcast and you said that you just wanted to go packing and say that, okay, Everest is my next step. <laughs> um, all the yeah. uh, pent up adrenaline, I think, because of the COVID or do you really see, yeah. see plan to see it through? I would much rather uh, do something which is a bit more inclusive with my kids right now. And uh, I'm I'm trying to, I have taken them out for a backpacking trek, you know, like a nighter kind of a thing. So if I can get them to start accompanying me, even on my Himalayan treks, I would be uh, eternally grateful. What do you really get a kick out of? You know, what are you hooked on to in trekking? What is the oh. thing that, yeah. Yeah, lots of things, you know, I mean, uh, just to pick a few examples, you know, one is uh, fresh air. Uh, You know, I live in a place called Gurgaon, which hits four (laughs) digits a few days a year, four digits, right? And uh, 
California complains when their AQI goes to 200. <laughs> so fresh, you know, uh, fresh food, you know, the, you know, just the aroma of that Maggie up in the mountains after mm-hmm. a long day of trek. Um, you know, it is no Maggie in Gurgaon will ever taste like that. It's not fresh uh, food though, but still, yeah, okay. <laughs> the definition of freshness is very different when you're trekking. I'm sure. <laughs> Um, I I completely enjoy the detox, Um, you know, so for for about 10 days, you know, the mind really gets to detox and uh, rejuvenate. Uh, Invariably, the places where we are trekking don't have coverage uh, for at least about five of the 10 days. The rest of the time, you're traveling in cars and all of that. Mm -hmm. But when you're, you know, hitting the higher ranges, clearly there's no signal, you know, that detox, Mm -hmm. you know, and the ability. To train the mind every night to say that tomorrow I have to, you know, and, and we typically have a briefing session the night before or the mm. evening before the sun has set, saying that tomorrow where are we going? And, you know, the guy will tell us that you see that bump out there, you see behind that there are those three peaks. Mm-hmm. At the end of that, there's a small little dip out there. That's where we're going to be pitching our tent. And when, you know, when you hear that the evening before, it's like, are you kidding me? You know, there is. <laughs> No way I'm going to get there in any other form of transportation than a chopper, you know. And the hmm. beauty is that the next day in the evening when you start part and then you tell the guy, where did we start today? And he does the same thing in the reverse direction to say that you see that little dip out there, go behind that. You see that second range of mountain. That's where we started off. That's when you feel that, you know, you have arrived. Hmm, right. So it's not so much about, hey, you know what, I've gone up and, you know, I've arrived in life or anything like that. But it's just those small joys of seeing where you started and where you ended off, um, you know, and and then, you know, interacting with the locals, you know, who are so unadulterated, you know, hearing tales. I mean, I do a lot of treks in the Uttarakhand area, you know, and one of the villages, which is at the head, is hmm. a place where the movement had started. And Sorry? in fact where the Chipko movement had started. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Right. Yeah. And uh, so one of so one of the Sarpanches out there, he's no longer, he's now aged. But, you know, the Sarpanch doesn't talk about the time when the Chipko movement was happening. And while doing that, he just cuts a branch and starts carving something on it and then, you know, barbecuing it in the fire. And mm-hmm. suddenly it becomes this beautiful, you know, mm-hmm. like a treasure. I mean, these are the joys that, uh, you know, I look for on my treks it is way beyond just trekking mm-hmm. but i think so it's a different lifestyle altogether that you need for those 10 days okay so any interest any story that you'd like to share on your trekking why don't what? i tell you of you know typical what does a typical exciting day look like on a trek why yeah. don't i tell you why don't I tell you one of those days? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, wake up in the morning with great mm-hmm. difficulty. You know, I mean, you've like huffed and puffed and gasped for breath all your night, tossing and mm-hmm. turning in your sleeping bag. And uh, God forbid, if you have to, you know, uh, address nature's call in the middle of the night, then it is like a half an hour exercise. Um, you know, just coming off the uh, the sleeping bag and the tent and going finding your place and all of that stuff. So visualize as you've woken up in the morning, you've seen the world's best sunrise ever. Mm. Uh, and then you start your day. And on one of these days, we wake up in the morning, bright blue sky, fantastic sunrise, you know, completely greater Himalaya snow capped peak for mm. about 270 degrees of the line of sight, right? I mean, mm. it's, uh, some of the peaks are so close that you can literally touch them. That's how close they are. Wow. So there, you don't look at the peaks straight. You look at the peaks like this because they are mm-hmm. so close. They are that high. It, after breakfast, we start leaving by about 7.45. Dark clouds. Mm-hmm. And it starts pouring. Okay. And we are at about 15,000 feet. Mm-hmm. And it pours and it pours and it pours. And we walk through wow. torrential downpour mm-hmm. on uh, what we call as a saddle point of a mountain, which means where the mountain is like this. So you're walking on this. Right? Mm-hmm. So you're completely exposed to the wind. Uh, you know, there is nowhere to go. You know, you have to just walk on the ridge. Mm-hmm. So we pitch tent about, you know, two o'clock in the afternoon and it is continuing to rain. Mm-hmm. And it continues raining and raining and raining. By about 6 p.m. it continues raining. Uh, the place where we had pitched tent had enough space for about mm-hmm. five, ten. 
that place is starting to now become a patlo uh, the mules who were with us you know they actually run away because it is raining so bad they go to the lower room. <laughs> okay yeah and, uh, we have dinner we retire for the night so two in a tent hmm. and then the rain starts getting accompanied by gale velocity winds and the gale velocity winds are you know i mean it could go up to easily over 100 km per hour and since you were on the trek was on the saddle point but where you pitched tent is typically off so you come down right. you can't pitch it on top you have mm-hmm. to come down right as you come down and uh, so we why so the wind is howling and we that entire night it rained till 8 o'clock in the morning so it was about 24 hours of rainfall and that entire night the only thought that we were all having in the tent is what if the tent gets blown away and we get thrown off the cliff with us inside the tent you know what if we never get to see our kid again you know what if we never get home so imagine staying up all night with those morbid thoughts hmm. to wake up in the morning to seeing that the kitchen right, tent has huh? <laughs> the kitchen tent has been washed away okay. you know the mules have come back your you know except for inside your tent everything is gone and uh, that's when you realize how small you are you know in the bigger of nature you know i'd like to ask you that when you are humbled and you know the whole thing of life's purpose all of that might seem just so trivial right when you're there i mean not that you do certain things to uh, to command a specific office or how do you um how does that change your perspective then towards life you know because you got to come back to work uh, you're right up there are you someone else are you yourself do you find like a disconnect between an oyon in the mountains oyon back you know your i feel the way i respond uh, right. you know to the situations mm-hmm. is no different and maybe you know one has helped me be better at the other and vice versa mm-hmm. so it's like you know i keep learning from both and right. it is subconscious it is not that you plan for it hmm. it you get hardened over a period of time right right that's that's quite nice in fact after your i mean after listening to you i have some hopes <laughs> of start getting to trekking myself with my son you know i keep joking with him you grow a little bit then we'll go on take off on our treks you know you and me alone or something because yeah. uh, you need to have that mindset right you just need to surrender yourself completely and there is there are no luxuries out there uh you got to yeah. be prepared to uh take it one day at a time and just be yeah. there yeah absolutely no no absolutely i really think that uh, you know in our country trekking with families and kids is um is uh, almost non existent right uh, but it in my mind it is an untapped adventure uh, mm. you know and especially given the sheer beauty of the himalayas i mean the himal mm. having done you know traveled a fair bit around the world you know rockies and the you know the alps and all of that i mean the himalayas are the himalayas i mean there is nothing that comes close i've been to alaska i've seen the tallest peak in north america mm. but you know you see the tallest peak in north america that is where our mid mountains begin right hmm. so you know it, it, i mean people talk switzerland and go gaga over it uh, and i really wish that you know we as a country felt more proud about our assets and our government did something about it i mean Absolutely. incredible india <laughs> it is incredible but um it is still not uh, tapped it is not still not understood yeah what's happening with the mountains right now the pollution you know and there might be laps of nature which is actually just left best to itself you know rather than us going and uh, yeah. wanting to explore each and every <laughs> corner that is inaccessible what do you think is this where where do you think we are heading in the in the future so uh, i think so look i mean balance is what is important out here um, and uh, as long as we do things in a measured way you know as long as we respect that nature you know uh, uh, that that it is nature and you have to i mean for example in our case we've had instances where we've gone to camping sites and woken up in the morning and taken a jhadu and you know we started doing jhadu on our own and the locals would come and say the nee nee hame karne dijiye you know because they would almost get embarrassed saying that you know why are they doing it and we have a very simple policy that we do not leave anything behind hmm. not even a trick 
So not that we carry toothpicks, but yeah, you get the picture. So when did you begin photography? Was this before um, trekking, during trekking? Much before. In 1989, it was an $89 used camera from my maternal aunt who lives in the US and she came for a wedding in India. And I really coaxed my mom to buy it off her and she actually bought it off her. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was a small point and shoot Nikon camera for $89. <laughs> That was my first camera. I've been a Nikon guy uh, all my life. I got my first SLR in 95. Mm. And um, and I've just been growing, growing, growing on that. And uh, I was perhaps one of the last guys to move to digital. Um, you know, while the world was moving to digital photography sometime around mid to late 90s, so about 96, 97, thereabouts, where the first, you know, semi-professional digital SLRs were coming up. I didn't go to a digital SLR till, if my memory serves me right, till about 2006 or so, mm -hmm. 10 years. I resisted it. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to do a lot of light photography, you know, and the difference between a slide photography and a negative photography, the slide is a positive, which means you see colors on the film and you project it. Uh, whereas right. a negative is a, is a black right. thing, which you have to right. develop and mm -hmm. then it becomes mm -hmm. And while slide photography is much tougher and it is much less tolerant to errors, you know, so the slightest bit of exposure difference mm -hmm. will result in an off photograph and you can't compensate for that, you know, in a lab. Whereas, uh, so, so I really grew up with photography in a very technical way. You know, I got deep into the subject. I understand the play of light and, you know, shutter and aperture and all of that. Um, and it pains me when I see people with, you know, $3,000 cameras, you know, just doing point and shoot in tubelit rooms. Any difference in what you used to shoot then and what you like to shoot now? <laughs> um, no, actually, I've always been very interested in landscapes. Uh, you know, I'm predominantly a landscapes guy. Um, and I, I used to, you know, hear all the time from folks in the family saying that you take such great pictures. But how come there are no humans in your pictures? So uh, I, I would say now that balance is a little bit more skewed. There is a slightly more balance, but it's still landscapes. Um, you know, but I fundamentally get energy from shooting landscapes. So no exhibitions or something that you've wanted to be a... Ever thought of that? Okay, I'll set up my exhibition. You know, honestly, no, never. Uh, I have... Again, I've heard many, many times that, you know, why don't you submit it to this place and that place and why don't you do an exhibition and why don't you put up an exhibition at the India Habitat Center and why don't you go to Lalit Kala? I've heard all of that. But I have, made, call it laziness, call it, you know, lack of time, call it, you know, not really looking for any public recognition um, that I have somehow not bitten that bit ever. And I don't see that changing as well. Stay, stay true to yourself, I guess. So, which camera do you use now? I only Nikon's. I just have Nikon body and Nikon lenses. Yeah, that's all I have. Uh, Is there any new passion or hobby or anything that you've taken up during this lockdown time? Ooh. I have tried my hand at cooking Italian, uh, oh. a full five course meal. Um, oh, you know, okay. so it started with an antipasti of a bruschetta mm. to a you know, to a olive mushroom, you know, uh, Alfredo sauce, pasta, to uh, butter garlic, button mushrooms, to a tiramisu. Um, you know, I have amplified my fitness, uh, you know, given that no trek this year. So I've amplified that. I am starting to, you know, really get into biking right now and something that I've always wanted to do. I've never ridden a, you know, a two-wheeler two properly in my life. Um, but uh, okay. I think so that's a bug that will perhaps bite me and I will, you know, uh, succumb to that uh, okay. sometime in the near future. Mm -hmm. I'm threatening my daughter and my wife that I'm going to learn threading. Um, what else? Threading. That I'm going to learn threading. Like, you know, the threading eyebrows. Are you so, serious? <laughs> 
Uh, I, I mean, why do that? I mean, for, uh, for your wife and your daughter, is it? No, I'm threatening them. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. So, so it's, uh, it's a good skill to have. Actually, that's when I realized that really, that's one skill <laughs> I ought to have. Yeah. <laughs> so look, I mean, um, but I uh, jokes apart. Um, you know, I just feel that uh, the last six months have been. You know, um, at right. least we have really loved it. the fact that you know we are getting to spend time together and uh, it has its you know ups and downs um, the other day my son told me that i'm not used to seeing you at home for so long uh, but uh, i have completely enjoyed it and you know i mean the one thing i keep telling you know my friends my teams is that please make good use of this time great but you didn't speak of one thing which you had told me earlier I, are you scared that i'm going to ask you to sing I don't. Oh, actually, you know, now that you mention it, I have started Hindustani classical music a month back. Yes. How can you leave it out like that? I'm waiting for you to say that. <laughs> I so I've started. Uh, I've started uh, learning from, uh, you know, from our long-term uh, piano sir. Uh, he's also a Hindustani vocalist. So wow. I'm learning Hindustani classical music. Fridays wow. and Saturdays. Sorry, Saturdays and Sundays at seven a.m. So now, how important do you think, Koyon, it is to? I think we've, of course, conversed about this, but to have that added dimension, you know, beyond your work, um, especially during these times, to find a passion, something that you connect to, beyond that work dimension. Uh, you know, I believe it is critically important. You know, for one's own sanity. um leave alone all the development you know talk but i think so just for a multitude of reasons the most important being you know get your head out of your laptop and get it out of the zoom calls that you're doing for 12 hours in a day and you know it's almost like you know do something you know which you've always wanted to do in this incremental time right. and uh, judicious about that you know don't don't be so fanatical that you give all of that time to your work and i think so what i see with younger you know uh, colleagues as well as you know younger cousins is that their life revolves around their work you know you try to talk to them they are busy they are working you know and it's like i have a call it's not that we don't we have calls too all the time saturday sunday you name it you know but you have to be mindful i mean there are times where you just take a break say that you know what today is a wednesday afternoon i'm going to be going out um, you can't go out but you know i'm going to do something else right uh, so to the extent that it is possible i believe it is worth you know people being a bit uh, uh, almost like forcing yourself to do something a bit different mm. and uh, if there is any time to pick up a hobby or two this is it right but again i'll do come it. to this again uh we on that uh, you you are in management consulting one of the craziest i think hectic most hectic schedules that one can have uh you've managed to uh, i mean keep i mean get on to those photography uh trekking very very new have to be gone for like 5 6 7 days sometimes so how has it happened yes you've uh, maintained it even you know not i mean not just now but even in your formative career right when you were relatively junior so how would yes. you manage that was there some kind of a thought that uh, what would my boss think of me if i take too much time or was it always disciplined into your uh, psyche that okay i have got to do this so you finish everything how does it work for for the people who say that i don't have time yeah i think so it starts by being very transparent um you know with your with your colleagues with you know your managers and all that it starts with that transparency it starts with you know adequate amount of planning and showing commitment to say that look i am going to be off air mm. but there are the five things that i preempt is going to happen during that time and you know you have to really lay down you know the eventualities you have to try and address those eventualities before you actually head off for that you know that two week trek and knowing fully well that there will be things that will happen outside of you know what you had predicted mm. but really having a support system you know within the team 
that actually can back you up when you're not around. And which is why I said that, you know, if one is mindful about it, this whole notion of work-life balance is overrated. You know, it's really about being transparent, being communicative, you know, having that respect, that rapport, you know, and it is always bi-directional to be able to do that. You know, encourage your teams to take time off, you know, just as much as the teams need to know that there will be times when you will not be around, you know. And uh, of course, in our setup, you know, we always work, uh, you know, hand in glove with a couple of partners. So, I mean, no client is ever serviced by one partner alone. So we always that team. Um, so that in itself is a great way by which at no point in time, you know, does the ball drop. You know, I mean, stuff always happens. Right. The other, I mean, even in my pre-consulting life, which I've always believed is that look, and this is, it may sound a bit, you know, provocative, but nobody is indispensable. Hmm. You know, and if you start with that notion that nobody is indispensable, including you, no matter how important and how strategic and how critical that work is. I think so if you start with that notion, hmm. then in my mind, the rest of the things fall in line. So, uh, Ayon, what does success mean to you? How would you see um, so far for whatever you've traversed? Uh, how do you see success and what does that mean to you? I think so in a very simplistic way to me, success is that, you know, if you've done something and uh, you've accomplished what you set out to accomplish, um, many years later, when you look back, you know, you feel that, yes, you created something and it doesn't need to be at work. It could be anything, you know, and when you look back to see what you did and did it have a long lasting, you know, impact on anything or anybody, I feel that feels very satisfying. What are you committed to keep alive in you, Oyon? I would say I uh, do feel good about the fact that, um, you know, I have a fair dose of humility uh, in just in terms of how I look at and approach things that I do. So I don't want to have any departure from that at any stage in my life, you know, and uh, so that's one. I think that that's something that I really value. Second is... Um, I don't know if the biological clock will agree or not, but I certainly don't want to let go youth anytime soon, uh, you know, in terms of my ability to climb and in terms of my ability to, you know, engage in uh, some of these activities that we've just spoken about for the last couple of hours. Um, and I guess on the work front, uh, you know, I thrive in situations of, you know, uh, of, of being able to, look at teams and help teams grow and help teams you know shine at what they do and help teams you know succeed in what they are doing uh, i really thrive in that kind of setup i get energy out of that i just hope that that never changes you know as i continue to grow and uh, oftentimes they say that you know as you keep going higher and higher your ability to stay connected with you know the mid management and the levels below becomes tough um, but i try and figure out a way to do that um, you know, so independent of who, uh, you know, the colleague is, uh, if the person is on my team, I try and figure out a way to create some mechanism to stay in touch, independent of where the person resides. I sincerely hope that I continue to, you know, spend enough time and energy to make that happen as time goes on. And then the last thing, of course, is, um, you know, just being, uh, uh, I don't know what's the right word for it, but um, just having a sense of, you know, fun. And uh, I do, um, I'm notorious for, you know, pulling people's legs. Um, uh, but uh, hopefully that will continue, uh, you know, for as long as, uh, you know, uh, that I can project. Thanks so much for this wonderful conversation and your time, Moyon. It's been a pleasure. And I hope and pray that you do get all your, I mean, you stay young. You do all the things that you want to. Uh, you take that trip with your wife uh, sooner and that you stay like the elephant, grounded, humble and wise. So thank you so much. You. For your time. Wow. No, absolutely. This has been good fun. I mean, it was a daunting thing when you first reached out to me. <laughs> it's been good fun. You know, thank you so much. And, uh, uh, you know, wish you all the best in everything that you do. Thank you, Oyon. Thank you so much for your yeah. time. Right. Take care. Bye.
Hey, Oyon, welcome to the CXO Fun Fact section. You ready for a couple of very interesting questions? <laughs> as ready as I always will be, Sanana. Great, and you can't back out of any. <laughs> I'll try my best. <laughs> okay, okay. Now, uh, I would have mm. it. I usually start with a favorite color cliche question, but since I've never really come across a guy who, who's named Oyon, I'd, I'd like to ask you, is there a story behind your name? What does it mean, first of all? And is it, what's the story behind your name? There's no story, but it is a Sanskrit word. And uh, if you heard of Ramayan, Uttarayan, Dakshinayan, mm -hmm. it's the ayan in Sanskrit, oh. <clears throat> which of course, you know, when Bengalis call it, it becomes Oyon. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but the meaning of the word is really the sun's axis. So the way you have Uttarayan and Dakshinayan, which is Apogee and Peri, so it's that ayan or Ramayan, which is the path where Ram traveled. It's that ayan, it's that path. So I'm the guy who's, you know, basically being walked over by a whole bunch of people. So, <laughs> Or the guy with the compass. So I'm sure you must not be losing your way <laughs> when you're on your trekking trips. <laughs> yeah. Fun absolutely. to guide you, huh? <laughs> absolutely. So what's your favorite color then? I'm wearing one right now. Oh, is that blue? It's blue. Yep. My wardrobe only has whites and blues. Is it? Yeah, wow. it's only white and blue, and there are some shades of pink and baby pink that's beginning to now sprout, oh. I guess, for the age. Yeah. Good. So uh, does that color represent you as well? Do you connect with blues and whites? Or is there some very contrasting color which you think, you know, your personality uh, jibes well with? I've honestly never given it a thought. It's just, I, I just feel that white and blue are very uncomplicated colors. It doesn't take too much effort to choose a blue or choose a white shirt. And uh, it's just grown on me over the years. Okay. Why not, why not a black then? I have one black shirt. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was for a theme party, which was black, and I was forced to go get a black shirt. But yes. Uh, black makes you... But I do have a whole bunch of black polos. Okay. Black makes you look very slim, but I, I'm sure you don't need that. I mean, you still look fit and fine. So, <laughs> okay. Something that makes, that. dash makes me want to head to the hills. Dash makes me want to head to the hills. If you were to fill in that blank. Gurgaon Summers. <laughs> okay. Uh, a dream trek. I'd like to go climb uh, Stoke Kangri all over again. Um, okay. And this time in winter. Ah, okay. The different set of challenges, is it? Right. You're also a photographer. So a shot that you'd like to capture. You oh, yeah. I'll tell you. Uh, so a couple of my most memorable shots are ones which I don't have anymore. And oh. what I mean by that is I'm just reminded of, you know, a trip that we'd made to Israel about three or four uh, years back with the family. And we were in this bird sanctuary and uh, there was this place just before sunset or after sunset. Mm -hmm. And there was a particular marshland, visualize this, you know, sun has gone down, sky is a majestic purple, magenta, mm -hmm. orange, red. And in this marshland are over 50,000 cranes. Wow. And um, it was that place was just on the verge of being shut and I literally rushed out. And I managed to capture the shot when all the all those cranes, you know, when the sun literally drops, those cranes just go one up, then two go up, then four go up, then eight go up, then ten go up, and then before you know it, there are fifty thousand cranes, you know, who are just like making a noise like you can't hear the person standing next to you, mm. and they just take off and then they fly away. Wow. I captured that shot, and. After I came back to my car, I said, let me look at these shots. Oh, no. And it so turned out yeah. that I was wrong mode altogether. Oh, gosh. <laughs> what was the best uh, shot that you captured then? <clears throat> I, I don't know if it's best or, Not you know, best, top as 10 as or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, the special one. Yeah. Yeah, look, I mean, uh, there are a couple. I mean, if I just maybe mention one of them, one of them is in a village called Shoja in the Himalayas. Mm -hmm. And it was a very uh, casual walk through the forest. And, you know, when I was looking up, like one level up on a wooden hut with a cow stable at the bottom. 
and you know through the picket fence where two small kitty heads popping out you know one big one small you know with stuff running down their nose and all of that and i have that shot it is still by far my most memorable shot because you know the look on their face uh, you know when you capture that it just tells you that how privileged we are you know staying where we are yeah. um, and uh, if you for a moment try to live the life of those kids up in the greater himalayas you know who are completely cut off you know we are like aliens to them literally i mean uh, i mean to me that is still one of it, that shot still gives me the goosebumps it was an accidental shot mm. but it still remains one of those where you know if i look back i can literally tell a long story on that mm. you plan to write <laughs> never time? never no <laughs> okay. no your favorite holiday destination the mountains every time mountains uh, my kids hate me for that so nowadays <laughs> it, the balance is shifting dramatically away from me it's it's at the beaches now <laughs> it is the beaches now exactly it is the beaches and <laughs> and it's becoming more man made cities right right <laughs> that's okay. really at the bottom of my pecking order yeah we haven't been able to step out uh, so let me ask you what is an underrated innovation you've been most grateful for during this lockdown my backyard actually <laughs> you know it is perhaps the least visited part of my house for the last whatever 14 to 15 years we've been living in this house right and right now my backyard is a full fledged playground you I know i mean you. i mean you have a backyard <laughs> Here yeah. in Mumbai, like we are just up each other's throats and noses. <laughs> Small pleasures, right? <laughs> right. Okay, a wild animal that you think re- represents you. This I want to know. <laughs> I don't get uh, flustered very easily. Um, you know, I mean, maybe you could compare me to a wild ele- elephant. Uh, wow. Okay. I'm not. I don't. Uh, I mean, I'm not very excitable very easily. The best advice you've received. I really cherish. Uh, Andy Grove's comment on um, you know only the paranoid survive. Um, it's held me in good stead for many many decades now. Okay, wonderful. And it's not that he gave it to me. I read his book. Yes, so. of course. <laughs> Tell us a couple of facts about yourself, um, which others might not only really know. Uh, Shubhra and I have been married for the last twenty two odd years, but we've known each other. Uh, you know, I mean, we were family friends. So from the time she was five. Um, that's a lesser known fact five oh, wow that is something <laughs> but just bongs in a small town cochin mm-hmm. you know back in the late 70s cochin wow that is something that is a nice setup there <laughs> novelistic you must write a book <laughs> uh, i'll get a ghost writer for that <laughs> we were in the same city for about 5 years and then you know we moved they moved all of that stuff family stayed in touch and you know i mean she came to college in delhi um, you know i went to the us and then we got got married so that's about it yeah it's fairly oh. mundane and boring oyon is how would you like to describe yourself fundamentally caring ah okay thank you so much for your time oyon great to have you likewise thank you so much 